We've been waiting such a long time for this day. I can't believe we're finally here. The gardens are finished and finessed to perfection and the great pavilion is packed with beautiful blooms. We've got you the best seats in the house for the best flower show in the world and we can't wait to get started. Welcome to the RHS Chelsea Flower Show 2021. It's so great to be back. We're here on the M&G Garden and doesn't it all look amazing? It's incredible. I do love this autumnal season. And you know what? We can't wait to show you all the floral fabulousness that's on display. Across the week, our team of gardening experts are here to help encourage and inspire you. We are packed with top tips, everything from creating an instant pond to topiary secrets and how to achieve the most beautiful blooms. James Wong will tell you everything you need to know about houseplants and Chris Bavin will be showing you how to get the best out of Chelsea without breaking the bank. And let's not forget, Rachel, Francis, Toby and Mark are all on hand to show you the best plants and how to use them in your gardens. You won't want to miss a thing and it starts now. Coming up today on the RHS Chelsea Flower Show 2021, an event supported by M&G. Francis Tophill heads to the pavilion to shine a light on a plant that we don't normally get to see at Chelsea, the aster, which is at its best in autumn. Lisa Snowden is here to share her love of all things green. She's been let loose on the showground to find answers from the experts on some of her gardening conundrums. And with sales of houseplants booming, James Wong will be showing us how to green up our indoor spaces and reveal the secrets to ensure they thrive and survive. <laughs> it is going to be a jam-packed week, isn't it? It certainly <laughs> is. Now, it might be late in the year, but the Chelsea Flower Show is still the floral event of the season. So with the hottest ticket in town, the celebs and VIPs are here to get an exclusive first look as we officially open our gates for 2021. It is so good to be back. I've been going to festivals throughout the summer, I've been going to gigs, but this is the thing that I'm probably more excited about than anything else. It's just, it feels wonderful. People were gardening during lockdown, but it's still not the same as getting together and celebrating what's one of the best dates in the calendar. This is Chelsea, yeah. We're all back in touch with our, our natural sides, aren't we? Spending more time at home with our gardens as well. So absolutely right that it should be back and great to see so many people here. What I just love about it is I learn something. Every time I come here, I find something else out about plants that I didn't know before. And it's really beautiful as well to see a very different series of gardens, very different to the ones we're used to seeing in the spring. This is amazing. I mean, I, I must say, I didn't, expect, I, mean, I didn't expect massive, great hulks of rock and Yorkshire dry stone walls. The nation's sort of aching for events like this, just to get out and be in the open air and really appreciate nature. The atmosphere is what, what makes Chelsea, isn't it? And, and it, it, it looks so beautiful. And we're blessed with a fine day, which I think wasn't forecast. And um, so what could be better? I think the displays are, are stunning. I've never seen anything quite like it. What this is, is a convergence of the most magnificent quality, the, the best of what we do in Britain in relation to gardens, and we are really good at it. There's a huge buzz. Everybody who is here is really excited that finally we can hug. <laughs> finally we can see something all together that's beautiful and celebrate nature the way it should be celebrated. Do you remember the story of The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett? It was a book about a young girl who discovered a magical garden and has gone on to inspire a generation of readers, including designer Tom Hoblin, who's brought his own secret garden to Chelsea this year. Tom, welcome back to Chelsea. Always good to see you. And what a beautiful, magical garden oh, you have created you. here. How difficult is it when you're inspired by such a famous book to put your own mark on it? I find, yeah, the book is better. I mean, I grew up 
with The Secret Garden as you did. And, uh, you know, it's the book, the children's television series, and I kind of try to yeah. just grab little bits from those and put sort of my own interpretations. So it's not, it's not, I'm not representing the book or anything. It's just my idea of what a sort of secret sanctuary type garden would be. Sanctuary, what a great word. I mean, yeah. it feels like such a retreat, but it is a garden of two parts, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, from the story, I always imagined the sort of outer gardens to be quite wild and quite unkempt and uncared for. And then, and then when, when, when Mary climbs over the wall into the garden, you've got this sort of very sort of magical atmosphere. And so I wanted to use really sort of exotic uh, plants. Yes, very yeah. naturalistic out the fact. Standing here, looking out, you do feel that you're on your own, that you have found that hidden garden. But these walls, these Louvre walls are so clever because everybody can actually see in. But yeah. you don't feel that when you're standing here. Well, it was a bit of a, a dilemma, really, because if I'd put a solid wall around here, I think people would ask for their money back for coming to Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wanted to kind of have it just enough of a gap. I, I, I wanted it to say, when people look at it from a distance, it looks like a sort of monolith almost, like a proper solid wall. But when they walk up and walk past, you get glimpses into the garden, a sort of sense of discovery, which is kind of relevant to the book. Yes, certainly. Yeah. That peace and tranquility. And it is a retreat and no door with no key. Yeah, it's the funny. The famous key. I know, it's funny you should say that because... Literally, when we finished building, a robin flew in here and sat down there in that dahlia. It was like it was a sign. Yeah, an omen. Hopefully, it's a good omen for my medal. Now, I can <laughs> see there's just a little mark up there. Tell me more about it on the side of the panelling. Oh, yeah, I, that was another chance thing. Um, so, Jan, who made this, uh, this wonderful wall, uh, he was cutting it and suddenly sparks flew out from his saw. And uh, it's a little bit of metal. It's actually a musket shot because the, the, the trees were well over 100 years old and it was embedded right in the middle. So we've exposed it <laughs> so everyone can see it. I love that. I love the touches. And what's your favourite part of this garden? The inner sanctum, shall we call it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love ferns. I just, I mean, ferns are just the most fantastic thing. And, and so the fact I've got to use a lot of, lot of ferns in here, uh, I, I, you know, and, and actually, interestingly, even though they're not even flowering, I've got a lot of great uh, foliage dahlias as well. So, uh, so yeah, I, I just, you know, it's very easy to put together something that looks very exotic uh, with, you know, good leafy, leafy plants. It looks magical, an absolute century. Congratulations and enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks, Nikki. Oh, I love the secret garden book growing up. I might have to give it another read. Well, this is the Great Pavilion. And inside, some of the world's most prestigious growers and plant nurseries showcase the very best flowers, trees and floristry you'll ever see. Now, normally it's packed full of people clamouring to get a good view. But in our first secret Chelsea of the week, I was given exclusive access to this impressive place first thing this morning before anyone else. Well, this is exciting. I can't quite believe my luck. I am in the Great Pavilion. Lots of hustle and bustle, people preparing for the doors to be opened. And in a bit, I'm going to be talking to Helen Boehm, who's been managing the Great Pavilion for the last seven years. But in the meantime, I'm going to have a snoop, because this is Super Chelsea. Oh, I love a bit of colour, as you can see. And if you thought there'd be no colour here at Chelsea at this time of year, you'd be wrong. I do feel like I'm on a theatre set and the monument is centre stage. The colours used here are so warm and inviting and the use of lighting makes it really ethereal. I mean, this is a real departure of what we're used to seeing from Chelsea in May. Helen! Oh, hi, Angelica. <laughs> Welcome to Chelsea and to the Great Pavilion. Thank you. It's all coming together, isn't it? Yeah, it's great to finally be able to relax a little bit now that all the exhibits have been built and we are ready to show it off to all of our visitors. Helen, what's your specific role here then? So it's my role to look after all of the nursery exhibitors that come to the show, to the pavilion, and make sure they get the most out of being here, really. I also go out and find new nurseries to come and exhibit at shows. I'm really looking for specialist growers of plants that we don't 
normally see here or mm. people wouldn't see in their garden centres. So it's my role is to try and find those people and bring them here. Yeah. Um, and being here at Chelsea for this show, we've been really lucky. We've been able to attract 20 new exhibitors into the pavilion for the first time. Some of them are really small, passionate sort of hobby growers, others are our businesses and nursery owners. So it's actually a real kind of honour that they've been able to get here and I hope they do really well out of being at the show. Thank you so much for speaking to me. You're welcome. Just enjoy the show. Will do. Okay. Take care. All right. Ah, oh, I love the autumnal feel in this part of the Great Pavilion. And apparently this huge pumpkin, and I love pumpkins, weighs almost a ton. Now, I'm not going to pick this one up, but I've been given this cute little one, so I'm off to the ball. In tomorrow's Secret Chelsea, we'll be speaking to an RHS judge who tells us exactly how they decide what makes a medal-winning garden. Chelsea in September means new plants in the pavilion and on the garden, so all week we're going to give a few seasonal blooms their moment in the spotlight. Today, Francis Tophill tells us everything you need to know about the astonishing aster. This is the perfect time of year to enjoy the largest flowering plant family, the daisy family. And one of its star attractions is the Michaelmas daisy, or the aster. As its name indicates, it comes into flower at Michaelmas end of September as the days shorten. And that shortening day is what triggers this beautiful plant into flowers. And they are absolutely stunning. Now, the name aster actually means star in Greek. And you can see why, with that beautiful shining yellow centre surrounded by deep blue, purple petals, it really gives the impression of the nighttime sky. Now, as far as naming these goes, it has gone through a little bit of a shift recently. Some of them have been renamed as Symphia trichum, but that is not something that most of us have to worry about. Now, when you're planting them, think about where they've come from. These are a North American species from the prairie and they like to be in open, sunny positions and look absolutely glorious when surrounded by other prairie plants like grasses and other daisies. Now the bees and pollinators absolutely love these. So if they're in a bright part of your garden, all of those buzzing insects will be able to see this flower and come right to it. come into the Flora Marquis, where there is a whole range of different cultivars for the Aster Connoisseur. And this is an absolutely glorious one. It's called Little Carlo, and it has beautiful lavender-coloured flowers that are quite small, but it is incredibly floriferous. You can see the whole thing is an absolute mass of flower, which is so gorgeous. That is definitely... in our gardens and asters certainly fit the bill. Still to come on today's show. Toby Buckland is here to show us how Chelsea trends can inspire our gardens at home no matter how big or small your space. Self-confessed gadget lover Chris Bavin is checking out the contenders in this year's Sustainable Product of the Year competition and revealing the winner. 
And at the end of the show, in the first of our Chelsea clinics for 2021, Rachel Detain will be here to answer all your gardening questions. But before that, I've been joined by TV and radio presenter and gardening lover, Lisa Snowden. Lisa, welcome to Chelsea. Thank but not you, your you. first visit, I understand. It's not. I've been lucky enough to come twice before. This is my third time. Loving it. It's so inspiring, oh, isn't it? Absolutely. And it has a different feel, a different approach this year, a real celebration. Because you're passionate about gardening, aren't you? I love being in my garden and just being around nature just makes me so happy. It brings me so much joy. So over the last 18 months or so, yeah. how important has your garden been for you? It's been my sanctuary. I've been I realised how lucky I am to have an outside space and I've just absolutely cherished it and spent so much time in it. Love it, absolutely love it. It's a lifesaver. I mean, we've been quite fortunate, haven't we, with the weather, certainly mm. first lockdown. We could get out there if we were lucky enough to have a garden yeah. and really invest in it. Yeah, absolutely. We love planting, we love weeding and just taking care of everything and love a little trip to the garden centre as well. A bit partial to that on a weekend. So what's the favourite thing about gardening for you? Because I know you're a bit of a, a house plantaholic, aren't yeah, you? I am. How many have you got? Well, around, around about 100, maybe more. There's literally plants in every room. We've got this lovely garden room as well, which is literally just covered in plants. I just love being around live, breathing, you know, just nature just makes me happy. It just really just invigorates me. So lots of time in the house, caring for the house plants, and then just lots of time in the garden, just getting my hands in the soil, my feet on the grass, nurturing, watching things grow. It's just, it's brilliant. It's Encouraging absolutely beautiful. Encouraging wildlife Encouraging well. wildlife, so many butterflies and bees and birds and hedgehogs and all sorts in the garden. It's a joy, it really is. So do you have a favorite season when it comes to gardening? Well, I do love spring, obviously, because everything just comes bursting in into flower and the colors are just amazing and sometimes in the winter I sort of look in the garden and I think oh my god is it ever going to come back have I chopped it back too much and then slowly but surely things start re-emerging and it is totally magical but it's been exciting coming here this time of the year because it's always obviously in spring isn't it yeah very so different. to come in September and just to see you know just how everybody's been able to sort of preserve a lot of the plants and it's yeah it's amazing yeah. it's amazing and, and that different color palette yeah. as well as you walk around exactly you know like for me in the garden now it's all the virginia creepers coming out it's all those beautiful like rich rusts and reds and it's stunning it really is now, one of the great things about being here at chelsea is that we are surrounded by experts is there anything you need particular help with with your garden so much help go on i don't even know where to start well firstly alliums i yes. bought loads of bulbs and they're one of my favorite flowers haven't been able to get them to grow I think the squirrels stole a lot of the bulbs. Ah. Mm. So squirrel issues. So you'll be heading to the Great Pavilion then for the experts in there? Absolutely. Okay. I think I'm going to spend quite a bit of time in there, actually, because there's <laughs> loads of issues I've got. I just don't know where to start. And what else are you looking for? Um, slug. Slug yeah. issues, because the slugs have been rife this year. Um, they've been all over the tomatoes and the hostas, and so it's been quite tricky. And then I've got a fig tree. I've got this really beautiful fig tree that's really old and magnificent, and I've got so much fruit on it, but it just never ripens so i want to know what i can do there's going to be loads of people saying i have i'm in exactly the same position and when it comes to slugs oh my god the slugs if you get the magic answer do let me know they're all god's creatures i know but i don't want them anywhere near my we just hostas. want to repel them we just yes. want them to stay away exactly like little barriers yeah, all the way around exactly so i'm going to get some good tips and i'll come and pass them back to you if you want exactly. that will be fantastic well enjoy your time Thank wandering you. around you might see a few things that you're going to want to buy as well i'm oh, sure always i know always. it is inspiring but have a great time and we'll catch up with you a little bit later on. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. During lockdown, there's been a massive boom in our love of houseplants, with some companies reporting a 500% increase in sales. Now, to celebrate this for the first time ever, Chelsea is delving deep into this trend with a whole new category, the houseplant studios. There's an office, a bathroom retreat, and even a forest in your home. James Wong has been to take a first look and give us a masterclass in how to look after our houseplants properly. As a botanist, I'm fascinated by the therapeutic power of plants. And the amazing thing is that recent research is even showing that simply looking at them can have a measurable impact on both your mental and physical health. And after the last couple of years that we've all had, I think it's high time to bring the outdoors in. 
when it comes to houseplants, there are certain social media trends that are just absolutely everywhere. And this has to be the key one amongst them. Koke dama, which literally means moss ball in Japanese. And what these are is plants that have been tipped out of their pot, their root ball has been wrapped in living moss, and then they're hung up to create this really visually arresting effect. Now, the number one thing you have to know about these is they're not for beginners. They are really, really tricky to care for. So if you've tried and failed with one of these, do not feel bad, particularly if it's your first ever houseplant. I have killed dozens of these things before getting them right. So the most important thing you need to know about caring for them is watering, which can be tricky. You need to take these down off where they're hung up and water them via the immersion method. That basically means sticking them in a bucket or a sink of water until bubbles no longer come out the surface and then just hanging them back up out to dry. Now, sometimes there are really innovative ways to display plants that by complete coincidence also makes them much easier to grow. And the staghorn fern, we have a beautiful specimen here, is a really classic example of this. Now, in the wild, these go clinging to the branches of rainforest trees where they're constantly battered by monsoon rain, but it really quickly dries off. To me, what's really fun about this is it's sort of a plant-based take on the taxidermy trend, which they've obviously echoed here. So they have some replica antlers up here and some botanical antlers over here. Now, I share my tiny one-bedroom flat with 500 houseplants, but I also have a full-time job, which involves lots of travel. And that's why I love terrariums, because they make it all possible. Inside the glass here, humidity is trapped, which means if you grow plants in a terrarium, they're gonna need significantly less water than if you grew the exact same species outside. And in fact, if I was to seal the top with a cork here, as I can see a bunch of examples have done in this exhibit, you'd probably only need to water it once every couple of months. So they're the perfect way to grow plants if you're busy or like me, simply very forgetful. Handy hints as always, and James will be back a little bit later on to show us how to use all our newfound houseplant knowledge to create our very own succulent bulb. Now, it might sometimes seem that the perfect show gardens of Chelsea are a world away from your own backyard, but we're here all this week to help you realise just how relatable they can be. And joining me on the Psalm 23 Garden today, I'm very pleased to say, is designer and gardener extraordinaire, Toby Buckland. Angelica, why you brought me here? I just love this garden. Psalm 23 actually means so much to me. My granny used to recite it to me every night. Uh... The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And this is exactly how I would have imagined it. That's so beautiful. You've got to be careful. I've only got to see a cat with a limp and I'm starting to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm welling up. Oh, yeah, and it's, it is lovely, and the genius of it is that the poem, combined with the location that this garden is distilled from, Dartmoor, has reduced the palette of materials, if you like. It's simplified things, which could be ultimately incredibly complicated. So how can we sort of relate this and bring this to our own spaces? Right, well, I think it comes down to simplicity. It doesn't look simple, but what this garden has is a strong theme, and that stops that awful thing of choice paralysis, where you've got so many left and right terms, what you buy. If you've got a strong theme, you can fit within it. So this is Dartmoor, certain type of stone, simple planting, muted colours, naturalistic yeah. look. Yeah, because it just seems like organised chaos, because sometimes <laughs> you know with planting and you yeah. see these show gardens, they look so, so structured. Do you like organised chaos? Is that what I do, because here it just seems like everything's growing out and you know, there's freedom. Yeah, yeah, it has that vibe. And I think it's the vibe as opposed to the literal look of this garden that's easy to copy. Limited materials. Yeah. Get a bit of height from trees. Yes. Because even when you close your eyes, you can hear the birds. You could be on Dartmoor. And it, yeah, simplicity is genius. Thinking out of the box as well, because maybe boulders for seats and... That is a very clever thing. You've got to have somewhere to look at your garden, but does it have to be a seat? If you could get a big rock, work it in. <laughs> But you're not going to have a waterfall in every garden. What? <laughs> <laughs> Bit noisy. That's properly loud, isn't it? Yeah. But if the neighbours are barbecuing all the time, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps something with a bit of splash like that is the way to go. But, yeah, water brings the vibe. Fountains, substitutes. Toby, thank you so much. Always love speaking to you.
Lots of great things to think about there. And Toby is going to be back throughout the week with a design masterclass for our own gardens, which I can't wait for. Now, Chelsea isn't just about show gardens. It boasts a vast array of almost anything horticultural you can think of. And this year, the RHS has created a brand new award for best sustainable product. So we sent Chris Bavin to check out the runners and riders for this coveted new prize. I love gardening and I love the environmental benefits of gardening. So I'm really excited that for the first time ever, the RHS is running the Sustainable Product of the Year Award. I'm off to see some of the shortlisted ones. This runner-up is a portable grow bag, ideal for growing vegetables. So there's a couple of clever things in here. There's a little reservoir system at the bottom, which is great for nutrient retention and water retention. It's also got this netting, which allows you to use no insecticides or pesticides. And to show you how portable it is, I'm gonna take this one home on the bus. This runner-up is a compostable loo with a difference. It's portable because it's on wheels and it also separates the ones from the twos, the solid from the liquid. The liquid you can use straight away to water your plants and then the solid goes in here with a bit of dry plant matter and then you can enrich your soil with your own waste. If you're worried about the smell, don't be unreliably informed. It smells like a forest floor. Of course, there could be only one winner, and that's Ali, who's designed some fabulous plant pots with a really interesting story behind them. Ali, first of all, congratulations. Thanks very much, Chris. How did it feel to win the first ever Sustainable Product of the Year award? I was absolutely astounded, to be honest. Absolutely delighted. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so tell me, you've designed these, you've created these. Yes. There's a nice backstory to them. What yeah, is it? There's a bit of a story, yeah. I'm a commercial diver. Diving in waste plastic every day was the inspiration behind the product and had an idea to turn rope and fishing net material into a sustainable plant pot that can be recycled again. So we started to look at recycling with the waste material. I taught myself plastic moulding in my shed. Uh, we made some small prototypes. My children helped pick plastic off the beach. We put them into our prototypes and it went from there, basically. We got to a point where we couldn't do any more ourselves, so we took a big massive gamble and we invested in the mould. Uh, we've now got a factory in Scotland and we're making our own uh, pots from rope and fishing net material. Listen, congratulations again. This looks like a fabulous product. I love the colour. It feels really strong and durable. Yeah. And the fact that it's either preventing plastic from going into the ocean yep. or eventually taking it out of the ocean... That's right. ..is a fabulous thing. It is. Thanks very much, Chris. Well done. Brilliant. So we're joined by James again, and it's time to get creative. What are we going to be making, James? We're going to be making some succulent planted bowls. You see, when I hear the word succulent, and I love them because I've got a couple at home, okay. it takes me back to the 1970s and rock gardens. But they've really come back into fashion. Like all houseplants, they're suddenly everywhere. You know, there's at least three different exhibitors that I've seen with incredible displays in the main pavilion, and two of them are new this year. So lots and lots of new, new inspiration to be had. Well, they do look very exotic, but what exactly is a succulent? So this is the fascinating thing. They all look exotic, but some of the plants you've got there are native UK plants. So the one thing that joins all succulents together is they come from arid environments in all different parts of the world. The one thing they, they have in common is that they have these gel-filled, fleshy leaves, and that's an adaptation that fills them with water so they can get hold of moisture wherever they are in the world, whether that's the deserts of South Africa or mountains in Scotland. And pretty easy to maintain. You're going to okay. give us a few hints on that one. Yeah. Now, you're going to make a, a beautiful pot display. Yep. 
What have you got in there to start okay. off with? So the most important thing I'm going to start off with is your growing media. This is just a regular shallow pot. You could use a deeper one, but because cacti and succulents don't generally have very deep root systems, I like to start with a shallow one. And the most important thing here is a growing media that mimics their native environment. So one that's filled full of grit. You can buy it as cactus and succulent compost already in any garden center. And what that stops is having loads of water at their roots, which can cause rot. So succulents are super easy in terms of, if you're like me and you're forgetful of watering. However, if you overwater them, like the number of times people, someone said to me, oh, I'm such a terrible gardener, I killed a cactus. It's really easy to kill a cactus if you overwater them. So and underwater. This, exactly. This mixture is going to allow that not to happen. So what varieties so, have you lined up for us? So I've got a whole different range oh, of stuff. There's so those. many amazing things. So this is a house leek, Sempervirens. It's native to the UK, looks super exotic, almost like an aloe, but they're, they're quite unrelated. They've just evolved to look similar because they come from similar environments. I'm going to pop him in here. And, and then, all these different varieties can sit quite comfortably together. Absolutely. So wherever they are from in the world, they usually have very similar uh, maintenance requirements. So what they all need is loads and loads of light and not too much water. And when I say loads of light, either with all of these, you could actually plant them outdoors. But if they're indoors, they need to be right up next to a window, no more than one meter away for them to survive. So this guy, Echeveria, is from, probably from, I think, Latin America, places yep. like Mexico. And that's going to survive right next to this guy that's from places like uh, Wales and places like Scotland. So I'm going to stick them together there. And the one thing I do is when you're planting them is have them slightly proud of the surface of the soil. Yes. And what that's going to allow is, again, really, really fierce, sharp, sharp drainage. I don't want to so. stop you, but how yeah. do you know when a succulent needs more water? OK, so the one thing that you'll notice is they'll start to maybe shrink up a little bit, go a little bit wrinkly around the edges. And as soon as you water them up, they'll plump right up again. But the most important thing with them is to, if there's any doubt, is to not water them. Any on the doubt, side of caution. leave it out. Exactly. This, these will survive for months and months and months with zero water, but they could die within a few weeks if you keep it proper sodden. So don't water them, don't overwater them. I'm liking succulents more and more. Okay. I must admit, I do think I overwater mine slightly. It's the most common cause of houseplant failure is people overloving them, which is a great problem to have. Yeah. Because if you simply chill out about it, you'll get much better results. So low maintenance, yep. high impact, look, taking shape okay. already. Exactly. So if I was to finish this off, all I would do is cover this grit over the surface. Yes. And I would normally do this because it gives it a nice, neater look, but also it has biological effects. So it creates a kind of uh, pocket of air on which these plants can sit, and they're not sit sitting soaking in water. So if you do overwater them and their roots do rot away, amazingly, the top part of the plant, if kept dry at the base here, can re-root. So it just gives you a little, little safety window. Clever, clever. Um, James, I've got my eye on that display when yeah. you've finished it. Oh, yeah, that's coming home with me, if that's all right. <laughs> Absolutely, and I'm going to hold promise, another one. promise not to overwater it. Thank you, as ever. Now, early in the show, I met up with Lisa Snowden. She's been off exploring the showground to get some help with her gardening dilemmas. Let's see how she got on. Chris, hi. Hi, Lisa. You have got the most amazing selection of fruit and veg. Makes you feel hungry, doesn't it? I'm starving. <laughs> Is it wrong? I was like, can I pick a tomato? <laughs> So Chris, I've got the most amazing fig tree in my garden and it's beautiful and every year there's so much fruit but none of it is ever edible. What am I doing wrong? I think your tree's got too many on it. That's the problem. It, it's being oh, too it's prolific. It's huge. Yeah. And it's beautiful. But it's, OK, so then give the energy and the life to the new fruit that wants to come. That's okay. correct, okay. yeah. And do remember that not all figs are brown or purple when they ripen. Some figs are actually green or yellow. Okay. So you may be throwing them away when they're actually ready to eat you. That is a really good tip. <laughs> my figs will not go to waste now. <laughs> Thank you. Mark, hi. Hello. Oh my gosh, the alliums, they're amazing. Thank you. You're like the allium king. Yes, we are. Oh, do you know what? I've got to say, I've got such a soft spot for alliums. I absolutely adore them. And a couple of years ago, I came to Chelsea and I bought tons of bulbs. And the squirrels literally ate every one of my bulbs and I had no alliums. I was devastated. So have you got any tips? Chicken wire is the best thing to do. Just cover them 
and then they're fine. So what about the depth of planting? Maybe I didn't plant them deep enough and that's why the squirrels got to them. Planting depth for uh, bulbs in general, especially alliums now we're talking about, uh, it's about two and a half times the size of the bulb. Amazing, thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, you have got the national collection of the smaller and miniature hostas. Beautiful. Thank you. Now, I love hostas. They don't tend to survive in my garden because everybody knows that they are like magnets for slugs. Slugs and snails hate the onion family completely. If you make up a garlic spray, which you can quite easily do, the recipe can be found on the internet, and you spray it on the leaves and the slugs and snails will stay away. You do this every two weeks, it will last for a year if you put it into a screw top jar. What you then take is one teaspoonful into a, a one litre spray and you fill the rest up with water, shake it all up and then you spray it on your leaves. Jonathan, amazing advice. It's been so lovely talking to you. Thank you so much. What I love about Chelsea is that if you have a question about anything garden or plant related, you can always find an expert to answer your question and give advice. Now, who doesn't love a bit of bedding, the versatile plants that keep on giving? Mark Lane's here in the Great Pavilion to find out what's on offer this year. Bedding schemes were the height of fashion during the Victorian times, but over the years that mass of colour has slightly changed to more sustainable perennial planting. But now is the perfect time to say goodbye to that summer bedding and hello to autumn winter bedding plants. Here on the Birmingham City Council display, they're using bedding plants to show off the theme of city living and sustainability. We've got wind turbines, water turbines, solar panels and more. And of course, these lovely bedding plants that really just say, hello and look at me. We've got a real sense of mixology here. And what I mean by that is we've got summer bedding plants mixed up with autumn bedding plants. Now, of course, in our own gardens, we couldn't have displays like this because of the cold weather and the forthcoming frosts. But Birmingham have put them all together to just show us that wonderful colour that you can get from bedding plants. We've got the summer bedding plants, such as the New Guinea Impatiens or the Busy Lizzie. These are brilliant because they're actually mildew resistant. Then we've also got the lovely dahlias. And then we've got the wonderful begonia. You've got to have begonias if you're gonna have bedding plants. When it comes to the autumn plants, we've got the beautiful white chrysanthemums. They all flower for weeks upon weeks. Then we've got the cyclamen. And a good tip when you actually buy in your cyclamen is to buy them when they're in bud, because that way they're gonna flower for longer. And finally, violas, one of my all-time favourite plants. They're going to have this lovely honey scent, and these particular types are multi-branching, which means you're going to get more flower for your buck. Here on the Sidmouth in Bloom display, the theme is all about diversity and protection. Protection of your local as well as the wider environment. Now during the sort of 17th and 18th century, bedding plants were huge alongside topiary. But here, rather than going for topiary as is a clipped hedge, they've used wonderful, beautiful succulents as well as foliage plants. So we got things like Autonanthera, Antonaria, Sedum, and Echeveria. And then, right on the top, that festuca grass, just to represent the hairs on its head. So there we have it. For mass impact, you really cannot beat bedding plants. 
<laughs> Only at Chelsea <laughs> will you find an elephant covered in plants. <laughs> so true. And I'm looking at your succulents. I love them. Did you do that? Uh, do you know what? I did a great job, didn't I? Yeah. Nothing to do with James Wong at all, obviously. <laughs> he takes all the credit, but they are coming home with me. <laughs> now, every day this week, we're going to open up our Chelsea Clinic. This is a chance for you to ask our experts any gardening question you like. And today, we're starting with a very special guest, Rachel Detame. <laughs> Welcome to the hot seat. Oh, it's lovely. It's very hot, I have to say. Yeah. Out for you. Very hot. Are you feeling the pressure? <gasps> yes. Should we get started? Yes. OK. Laura and Pam Jackson, hello to you, got in touch via Facebook. They say if they buy a nine centimetre potted perennial plant, can they plant it now or do they need to keep it in a greenhouse until next spring? I would say if it's a hardy perennial, which I'm sort of assuming it is, then even though it's quite a small plant still, I would definitely get it in because the soil is still warm at this time of year and it means that the roots can get out, they can really establish and you get nice, strong, young plants coming through in the following spring. So yes, I'd say so get they can it in. bed in properly? Yes, exactly. Okay, perfect. Well, this is from Anna in Mayfield. She has a purple-leaved tree, a smoke bush, but she's asking when should she prune it and how much should come off? Because sometimes oh. with pruning, you can get a bit... A bit happy. A bit snizzly <laughs> happy. Yeah. Yeah. A bit carried away. Yeah. I have to say, though, this is a cotinus. I love them when you don't prune them because they just develop this beautiful natural form and then that there's sort of lovely hazy flowers as well. Um, if it's too late and you've already got it in and you really do need to control it a bit, do it while it's still dormant, sort of before spring and uh, don't do too much. Just, a, yeah. just enough to keep on top of it. Good advice. Now, it is press day here at Chelsea. We've had the VIPs in. Deborah Meadon has got in touch. What has she got to say, I wonder? We've been struggling to get a wildflower meadow going. Um, and particularly this year because the grass has been really abundant. Um, so, I, you know, I would love some tips on how we get those wildflowers to come through what is pretty strong grass. Mm. Yes, it can be difficult actually to establish wildflowers in a, in a garden setting, usually because the soil is very rich and wildflowers need a more impoverished soil. So there are two routes really. You could take off all the grass and the topsoil and then sow wildflowers from scratch. Or you can use yellow rattle and you just get the seed in for that. And that's a parasitic plant and it will weaken the grasses and gradually over the years you get more wildflowers able to Ooh, germinate and come clever. through. Clever. Really clever. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've got a question from Floella Benjamin. So let's have a look at what her question is. Well, I've got a very sunny garden and many parts of my garden, the plants are dying and I want to know what am I doing wrong? So a very sunny garden, but the mm. plants are dying. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because yeah. you would have thought that's an ideal situation yes. for most people. Um, I wonder if there are two things, perhaps adding more compost, more organic material into the soil, um, choosing the right kind of plants, real sun lovers that you know love to get baked. Uh, and perhaps lots of watering at planting time because if you just let them get really thirsty they yeah. won't thank you for it so settling them in properly at the beginning yeah, yeah you never want to worry about tip. too much sun do you no, no i've never had that problem in fact i've had the opposite problem too much shade but too much sun I mean, but, that's... but you could do too much water as well especially when it's sunny you can yes it. yes really well hopefully floella you're watching and you're liking that thank you so much rachel and i will be My borrowing pleasure. that coat at some point oh you look lovely in this <laughs> always looks gorgeous doesn't she always our chelsea clinic will be open all week and tomorrow will be joined by francis Tophill. so get your horticultural queries to us via the gardener's world facebook page or use the hashtag BBC Chelsea on Twitter. Well, that is it. We've had a fabulous day, haven't yes. we? It's just been glorious. And we're back again tomorrow. We loved it. I couldn't agree more. But sadly, that's all we've got time for for today. We'll be back, like I said, same time tomorrow when we are joined by TV's Dr Amir Khan, who will be looking at the healing power of plants. And Rachel here, you're going to be meeting regulars, Chelsea yeah. regulars, who are bringing a whole new set of plants to the show. Mark is getting to grips with floristry and Francis will show you how to make your very own pond in a pot, <laughs> no less. <laughs> and there's something else in there. What are we missing? Oh, what is it? Mm, Medal mm, straight oh, I can't wait. We know it's going to be an early start, <laughs> that's for sure. But before that, don't miss Monty and Joe on BBC Two tonight at the slightly earlier time of 7pm for their first analysis of the show. And they're followed by Sophie and Joe on BBC One at 7.30 where they'll give you a first look at all the main show gardens and catch up with comedians Josh Widdicombe and Tom Allen, which will be funny. Oh, yeah, they definitely will. It's so good to be back. <laughs> 
back, isn't it? Lovely. Yes. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.